Well, hello to all the folks here and all the folks at home. We're glad you joined us today. Uh, well, we don't exactly have visitors today, but we've got folks that haven't been here for a while. Uh, Wayne and Carolyn, where are you? There you are. I haven't seen you guys in quite a while. <laughs> Dean and Barbara, we haven't seen them in a little while. Glad to have them here. Jim Burson. Jim Burson. All of him. All of yeah, all of him. Jimmy and Merle. I'm trying to see if there's any. Marilyn, you've you've been here sporadically. Yeah. In quite a while. Yeah. Bob's here. Uh, Carol, did you guys drag her here, Marilyn? Did you? Well, good for you. Well, I want to I want to thank all of you for uh, when you come in, as long as you're up and moving around for wearing your masks. Uh, we appreciate that. A lot of people that have been concerned about that that probably haven't come back. I just want to commend you on that. Uh, I don't have my mask on when I'm up here, not because I'm trying to uh, avoid any regulations. It's just a matter of clarity. Now, I'm sure this has not happened to any of you folks, but in restaurants and uh, convenience stores and uh, supermarkets, the people that work there have their masks on. And when they tell me something, they'll give me about a sentence, maybe two. And my mind is just going crazy trying to put the two or three words that I understood, make sense out of them, and then finally after what, I don't know how long it takes, seems like forever, it's probably about five seconds, I have to say, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Give you a uh, few announcements. Thank you for those of you that helped stuff the food pantry. They still have a few needs if you are interested. You can check in at the ministry galley, check, check what they need, and uh, provide the food there. And for all of you that are leaders in the uh, class of any, any leadership position, the leaders group will be Sunday, March 21st. And I will continue to uh, remind you of that, but I uh, just want to give you a little bit of advance notice. This COVID has caused a lot of fear and confusion across the country. To those that are staying home because of existing health issues, we, all of us, support that, applaud you for it, and hope that you recover from whatever the issue is soon. For those of you that are staying home for other reasons, I'd like to remind you that the longer you stay away, the easier it is to do so. So uh, we, contend, we continue in here, as I've mentioned, to, to the wearing of the masks. Our attention has been gradually increasing, and we hope that trend continues. Sunday, April the 4th, which we're calling Operation Fresh Start, will be an ex excellent time for you to return. There will be refreshments for a change. On that subject, we need two or three people that are willing to volunteer to put together refreshments. Marty and I are going to do that. We're going to buy three dozen donuts, cut them in half, wrap them in saran wrap so that people can individually pick them up. We'll uh, honor the wishes of the church to comply with the rules that they've got in place. So anyone that's interested, contact me after class today. Call me at some later date, that's fine. That's April the 4th that we're gonna to try to do that. Uh, let me give you a little bit of church humor today. The preacher told the lady, since you put that much money in the plate, I'd like to let you select three hymns. And she said, how wonderful. I'll take him and him and him. <laughs> What, what, words of wisdom for you. Some people are kind, polite, and sweet-spirited until you try to sit in their pew. <laughs> and, and this you need to take to heart. Learn from the mistakes of others. You're probably not going to live long enough to make them all yourself. <laughs> well, good morning. Good morning. 
It is so good. I'm going to echo. You've heard this twice already this morning, but it is so good to see all of you in this room this morning. Now, I have a little bit of pressure on me today because I have Beth right here on the front row. And she is taking notes and she's going to listen to every word I say. So if I seem a little stressed today, but it is so good to have you back. So good to have you back. And speaking of that, I want to share something with you. We got a card this week, and you know, we really appreciate getting cards from you guys. And it says, John and Vivian, thank you so much for remembering us with your note. Friends are like angels without any wings, blessing our lives with the most precious things. Thanks again. P.S. We'll be back in class soon. Now, this is a good note, and I encourage you, and I read that to you to say this. Number one, it makes me feel good to read things like this. But number two, I encourage you, actually I challenge you to look around in this room, this big room, and there's a lot of folks back today, and praise God for that. But if there's somebody you know that you don't see here this morning, whatever you do, whether Marty, it's pick up the phone and call them, send them a text, mail them a card, do you realize how that can change their life? We are a family in this class, so we need to reach out to each other and let everybody know how important they are to us. Now, that being said, let me go, i got to give you some facts. You know, every now and then, Beth, I get on this roll about statistically, let's look at something factual. You probably know this, but did you know a little bit over a week ago, we had snow. Does anybody miss that? <laughs> Did anybody not experience that in this room? I don't think so. And you realize, I, think, uh, I really think, Richard, it was Tuesday or Wednesday morning on my phone when I woke up, you know, I get the temperature, the time of the temperature, negative two degrees. Now, in my lifetime, I have never seen that in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. So I took a screenshot of that, Richard, just so I could verify that 20 years from now, okay? So there's fact number one. Fact number two, just a few days later on Wednesday of this week, it was 80 degrees. Welcome to Texas, all of those who are watching online, okay? And by the way, this is a good time. If you're watching us online or on television, put that pause button because I'm going to start teaching. I promise really soon you're going to need your handout. So go get that if you would. Number three fact. Then on Thursday night, it <laughs> hailed. So I, I can't think of hardly anything else we've missed. But you know, it dawned on me, Beth, here's what's going on. Do you realize that God is sending us a message? <laughs> He really is. In 2020, here was his message. Learn to stay at home. And we all did that. Some of us are still doing that. But in 2021, this is only February, and he's already sent us another message. And here it is. Same thing, stay at home, but now let's test your survival skills. <laughs> So here's where we are now, folks. I got to tell you, it's a, it's a wonderful thing, but I praise God for all of you that are here today. I thank you for the fact that God has spared us. We're all still alive. And from what I can tell so far this morning, everybody's in good spirits and you look like you feel great. So let's thank God in prayer with that. Last week, another marvelous lesson. If you don't know, we've been in the book of Luke for this winter Bible study session. And Richard, as always, did a great job in the seventh chapter with his focus verses on verses 1 through 11. Now let me remind you of the story just to give you a recap. He gave one of the greatest stories of I like in the Bible, and that's about the centurion Roman soldier, if you remember the story. And he was in command of over a hundred troops. Now, this centurion was well respected by the Jewish community. And why do I bring that up? It's because he was a Gentile. But he was yet had all the respect of the Jewish community. Now, the centurion had a servant back at his house who had become very ill. And at that particular time, the servant was very important to him. He were, they were just like family to him. So he had heard about who Jesus was. And he believed what Jesus could do, that he could help. So this centurion sent out some of his people to get this message to Jesus that he needed his help. Now let me stop here and kind of give you a little background. As you know in the scriptures, normally Jesus would not have gone to the home of a person that was not a Jew. The Jews just did not feel comfortable in the homes of a Gentile. This centurion knew that. So what did he do? He asked Jesus to come to him. Now, 
His request for help was answered by Jesus. And Jesus came to him and he said to him some of the most famous words. And Jesus even commented on this in verse 7, which is the key verse of what Richard taught last week. But just say the word and my servant will be healed. You see, this centurion's faith was so strong that he knew Jesus didn't have to go physically and see this man. He didn't have to go and physically touch this man. He could make it happen because of who he was. This verse is the heart of the story and the lesson that Richard gave last week. And Jesus marveled at this response. One of only a few times in the whole scripture, Jesus marveled at something that someone said. Never had faith like this been seen in Israel. And I remind you, he was a Gentile. Now, three points from last week. Number one, knowing and believing who Jesus really is was point number one. And we're going to touch on that on our lesson this morning in chapter nine. The second point was recognizing who you are and who you are not brings reality. And then finally, great faith in Jesus moves your request to him to reality. So there we are in verse seven from last week. Now, this morning, I am in chapter 9. Now, some of you, and Beth, you've already noticed it. You're going to wait, John. Chapter 8 comes after chapter 7. Well, we, in this particular study for the winter session, we did not have chapter 8 in this particular cover chapters. But I'm going to take just a few minutes because I think it's important that we look back and do a quick overview of chapter 8. So if you will bear with me, let's just do a quick overview of Luke 8. Now this is where Jesus is continuing to travel from town to town with his 12 disciples. Now why is he doing this? Anybody have a clue why Jesus is traveling from town to town with his disciples? Is it for the people that he's coming in contact with? Or as we delve into the scripture this morning, is it for those 12 disciples? Because you see, Jesus' mission was to train these 12 men to carry out his ministry after he descends back to the Father in heaven. Because remember, his ministry was how long? Three years on this earth. And he is trying to train these disciples for a lifetime to, treat the mul to teach the multitude of people after his departure. Now he was also accompanied during his travel by such people as Mary Magdalene, as Susanna, which was the wife of Kazua. And that's not a sneeze. That is actually that person's name, Kazua. Now these women, if you know these women, and you do because you know your Bible, they had all felt the healing power of Jesus and they were there to provide proof as he traveled from town to town of who he was and what he had done for them. Now there are three points in the eighth chapter of Luke. Number one, parables. Jesus was speaking parables in chapter eight. While his following was continually to grow, Everywhere that he went, Luke begins to write of some of the parables, things that Jesus was speaking to everyone, but most people had no clue what he was saying. I'll give you an example. He talked about the seed planter as an example of his mysterious words. Y'all remember the story, the parable of the seed planter? And here Jesus speaks of those that accept the word of God when everything is going good in their life. But then they kind of waver and start to doubt when things don't go their way. They start to wonder just a little bit. That's the seed planter. Now, he continues talking in metaphors, which a lot of people don't like, and you have to scratch your head over sometimes. But only his enlightened followers at this time really understood what he was saying. I'll give you another example. The parable of the hidden lamp. It speaks of how there are no secrets that can be kept from God. You know, I know a lot of people sometimes have that little silly grin, and they think, boy, I got by with that. My wife will never know what I did. Well, granted, on this earth, Richard, you might feel a little bit of fury if she was to find out, but rest assured, your Father in Heaven knows every single thing you've ever thought or said. This is what he's talking about. He says, all right and wrongdoings will eventually come to light. You can hide nothing from God. And then finally... You, you know, he talked about their journey by boat. He continued to travel by boat. Now, you all know this story. It's one of the most popular stories in the Bible. They were in a boat and they were traveling. And Jesus was asleep. 
And the waters, a storm came up, kind of like what they say we might have this afternoon. And the waves started rolling and everything. Well, the disciples became very scared. And so they looked back and Jesus was back there. He was asleep. And they were becoming very frustrated because they couldn't understand, what is he doing? He's asleep. We're going to die here. I mean, this is terrible things going on. So they went and they woke Jesus up. And they told him, they said, you know, Master, we're in trouble here. We're all going to die. Well, what did Jesus say to them? I mean, he looked up. I know what I would have said if I had been woken up for something like that. But he looked at them. He says, oh, ye of little faith. And he calmed the storm with just the movement of his hand. Now, can you imagine seeing these guys, especially guys like Peter? I can just visualize him, Ronnie, looking at Jesus and going, who are you? While these guys believed in him and they heard his teachings and what he said, when they actually could see these miraculous things that he did with just the movement of his hand, I would have said the same thing. Who in the world are you? Well, where that leads us to today's lesson very soon, but now his final point in chapter 8 was healing. You see, Luke goes on with Jesus and his disciples, and they are moving through, and they come across a man who has been possessed all of his life with many, many, many demons. You know anybody's possessed with demons? Bad things. The devil's helpers. That's who these demons are. Well, believe it or not, when Jesus approached this man, the demons quivered and they shook because they knew who he was. Now here's the point I want you to get out of this right here. Don't kid yourself. The devil knows who Jesus is. He doesn't need to be reminded who this man is. The demons... Everything that's evil on this earth, they recognize the word of Jesus and they recognize him when they see him. You see, that was obvious that he is the Messiah because of the reaction of these demons. So when they knew his presence was there, the high God himself was in their presence. So the demons were no match for Jesus. And he called them out in the name of God out of this demon-possessed man. And now this man was free of these demons. So this is what he was doing in regard to healing people as he went forward. And chapter 8 ends with Jesus and his disciples continually journeying on their boats. So this is the way we're going to end in chapter 8. Now in chapter 9, which this morning, I'm calling unashamed. Because Jesus' crucifixion was public, He expects us to live our faith and live our lives unashamedly and in the public life. So we're going to be focusing on verses 18 through 27. And we're going to see here how Jesus expects His followers to forsake all else for Him. Let me ask you something. Have you ever thought about this or do you know anybody like this or have you ever been this way yourself? I could testify to that maybe many, many years ago. Why might a person hesitate in certain groups to identify themselves as a follower of Jesus? Think about that. In certain circumstances, why would a person say, well, I'm just going to kind of keep that to myself. Well, you know, I'm in a restaurant, a crowded restaurant, and you know, I'll pray when I get home. I, I, I don't really feel comfortable doing that here. Why would somebody feel that way? Well, some might feel like that uh, they want to fit in with a specific group, and that group doesn't really feel comfortable with that or doesn't believe in that. So that Christian decides they shouldn't really make that obvious to the world that they're a Christian. Or they may be worried about the ramifications of saying this publicly. They might be criticized. They might be ridiculed. And in today's world, they could be physically harmed. So they think it's best they just keep to themselves. Well, like I said, Jesus' death was public. It was, it was God's will that it be public. It's also God's will that says, if you're ashamed to profess me before man, I'll be ashamed to profess you before my Father in heaven. So we're going to see this morning as Jesus addresses this issue. And you might be thinking who he's going to address this issue to. Is that us? Well, sure, he wants us to be aware of that. But again, I bring up to you these 12 disciples because it's going to be their job in the future to train everyone else and to teach everyone else to openly worship the Lord God through Jesus Christ. See, at this point, as we look at these verses in chapter 9, Jesus was at the point he was ready to give his followers, as I call it, some on-the-job training. Okay, and this is where, since they would be the ones carrying his message, then they would have to be the ones that would go back and give this word to the people that came forward when Jesus went back to the Father. 
Now, he sent them to surrounding villages, but not without a warning in verses 1 through 6 in chapter 9. Now, why did he do that? Now, I said it was on the job training, right? Well, the best way I've ever had employers teach me how to do a job was they just threw me out there in front of people and they said, John, I want you to go do this and this meeting is yours. And this is in your hands, you handle it. So Jesus, he taught by example. He says, okay, I want you guys to go here and I want this group here to go over here to this village over here. And you've heard what I've told you. Now I want you to go out there and I want you to tell them the good news. Now at this particular time, can you imagine how these disciples felt? See, they had to rely on God's power to get them through this situation. When we stand up here, any one of us that teach before you, we rely on God's power through the Holy Spirit to get us through that lesson, to reveal to us what it is He wants us to reveal to you. So see, these disciples were in the same place. And they were also having to rely on God's power for wisdom, not for material things. You see, He was teaching them another lesson too, a year or so ago. I think it's been, it was, we was back in the other room. I taught a lesson about how Jesus told these disciples, you know, you don't need any shoes. You don't need anything. You don't need, you know, a cane or anything to hold yourself up with. Now, if you've already got these things, that's fine. But you remember, they walked on rock streets and roads. And Jesus says, but you don't need anything but God's power. You need his wisdom and his power. Everything else will be provided to you. And that's what he's talking about here. Now, Jesus caught the attention of some powerful people during his these three years of ministry. And who would be the first person that would come to your mind? King Herod. Now this was not a good man, and to be quite honest with you, if I was going to grab somebody's attention bath, it would not be him. I would not want to grab his attention. But in verses 7 through 9, you can see that Herod has got his eye on Jesus. Now, before he had his eye on Jesus, who was Herod after? John. Absolutely the predecessor to Jesus himself. Now, John the Baptist and Richard taught about that. He was a powerful preacher. I mean, I can only imagine. I mean, Pastor Scott did an awesome job this morning. But can you imagine what John the Baptist, if you were just sitting there listening to him preach, how awesome that would be? I can just hear his voice as a majestic, well-spoken, clearly projecting person that was really speaking the word of God. Well, Herod knew this. And you see, he was a threat to them because he was preaching God's word. So Herod, we all know what Herod did to John the Baptist. Now, while Herod knew the power that John the Baptist's preaching had, he executed him because he felt like, I've got to get rid of this guy. This guy's a threat. He's got too much power. So now he was intrigued by this man they call Jesus. Now, what was Jesus doing? He was doing the exact same thing. He was coming around preaching the exact same word that John the Baptist was preaching. And after their ministry in the villages, Jesus took his disciples to a quiet place and he began to pray. And the people watched him pray. The disciples were there when Jesus prayed. And I want you to hang on to that thought because you see, the crowds followed Jesus wherever he went. So we were talking about prayer this morning in the service. You see, this is critical. Jesus came that first time as an example. Now he'll return as king. But the first time he came as an example. And he was teaching us that through all things at all times you should pray. So the crowds were following him. And once the crowds saw the desperate need he had for prayer, they left him alone. But they were still there around him. When he finished praying... He looked up and he realized if they followed me here and they sit through my prayer, they're in desperate need of my teaching. So he began to teach them. What did he do at that time? If you remember the story, these are all very popular stories in the Bible. He, there was a multitude of people, lots of people, a lot more than we're going to be feeding today at lunch probably after, after church. So he used a small little boy's lunch that was there in the crowd and it, that crowd, I'm, I'm guessing, Jimmy, what do you think? 5,000 people or more was in that group of people. He used that one little boy's sack lunch, what my mother used to send me to school with, peanut butter and jelly. And he, I don't know if that's what was in the sack. But he sent that little boy, took that lunch, and he fed over 5,000 people that had followed him there. Now, they saw this. This is going to be documented in verses 10 through 17. So finally, finding some time alone, 
He instructed his followers about what it truly meant to be his disciples. See, he was doing what he expected them to do upon his departure back to the Father. Now, it's kind of like, you know, guys, you know, you can relate to this. Harry, tell me if I'm wrong. But that is, you know, when you have people over at the house, does your wife sometimes tell you, you need to ask them if they need anything to drink? Mm -hmm. This is where Jesus was with the disciples. You've got this group of people. You've got to feed them, people. You've got to get them something to eat. So Jesus was teaching them how to feed the multitudes, which is what he was sent here to do. So after he had this time alone with his disciples, he was instructing them on how to be his disciples. Now this brings up our focal verse here in, 18, in verses 18 through 27, where Jesus knew they still had much to learn about suffering and being more like him. Let's go to the scripture. Let's look at verses 18 through 20, Luke Chapter 9. While he was praying in a private and his disciples were with him, he asked them, Who do the crowd say that I am? They answered, John the Baptist. Others, Elijah. Still others, that he is one of ancient prophets who has come back. But you, he asked them, who do you say that I am? Peter answered, God's Messiah. Now, in verses 18 through 20, sometime after feeding the 5,000 or more people, Jesus and his disciples, they found a nice, quiet, secluded place that they could regroup. Now, Luke noted numerous times about Jesus spending time praying. So do you see the importance of prayer in this passage this morning? He also showed this time of prayer prior to the key of major decisions or major events. So let's stop there. i got a question for you. When anything is happening in your life, do you stop and pray about that before you do it? Or do you just jump in and then see what happens and then pray afterwards? See, Jesus was setting the example that he prayed before anything happened, before he made any movement or took any action for anything. He prayed. So should we. His disciples were with him, and they were likely learning from this example because we all, I'm a visual learner. I've said that before. So if my leader is doing that, then I'm going to see the value in that, and I'm going to do the exact same thing. Now, after the time with the Father in heaven Jesus spent with him, he then turned his attention to only his disciples, only the 12 that was there. And he asked them a simple question. It goes right back in the verse that we just read right here. First question he asked them, he said, who do the crowd say that I am? Now, let's stop that. Do you think he really needed to know that answer, Ronnie? He already knows the answer. He knows exactly what everybody's thinking about him. So, who was this question actually meant for? Exactly. Let's move forward. His disciples had spent a lot of time with the crowd, so they had definitely heard many opinions about this Jesus. And some believed, like Scripture said, that he was John the Baptist. Others, Luke put it, uh, pointed out that Herod had already executed John by this time. So then some had doubts about that in verse nine, uh, 7 of verse, uh, chapter 9. Because they felt like, okay, well, he's already died, so maybe he's Elijah. Maybe, because you know, do you remember, you know the story about Elijah? He never had to suffer through death. So they thought, well, now there's a possibility. This guy could actually be Elijah. But ironically, some believed that Jesus was just the opening act to John the Baptist. So many people thought that John the Baptist had been risen from the dead and he was back as this man Jesus. Boy, these people had some messed up ways of thinking. Did you ever see John the Baptist heal anybody? Did you ever see John the Baptist work the miracle of feeding 5,000 people or more? No. So how in the world could he be John the Baptist? Well, anyway, a third group of people, and this is what I found to be very interesting. This sounds like something that would happen in 2021. A third group of people saw him as one of the other ancient prophets who had come back from the dead. One of the great leaders, you know, I mean, we, we've, we've taught on him. Because of his message of repentance and the kingdom of God reminded the people of these bold preachers from hundreds of years in the past, 
And this is how they learned about Israel's history. So they thought one of these guys had been risen from the dead and he was back. And guess what? They believed he was the prophet, the new prophet for their generation. That's what a third group actually thought. Now, while Jesus actually was a prophet, he was much more than a prophet. So this is where our journey continues. So Jesus may have found these opinions interesting, but not surprising because he already knew about this. But his main focus was on the disciples. Because you see, to him it was important to know what they really genuinely thought about who he was. So his first question that we saw here in verse 18 was just a tool to lead up to his main question, which was to the disciples, which was, you see what he said? But you, who do you say that I am? You see, if they don't believe, if they have no clue who he really is and what his mission for being here is, he cannot do what his mission was set out by the Father to do because these men are the critical aspect to his ministry. But if the disciples had accepted insufficient explanations from these crowds, and actually started to believing that way, the Messiah's mission and the part they were called to play in just wasn't going to work. So Jesus had to make sure. Peter, though, if you notice what we just read, answered for the group, and he stated that Jesus was God's Messiah. Peter saw that. And you remember it all started with Jesus and Peter. Back he said, upon this rock I will build my church. Now, did Peter have all the questions answered? No. He still didn't. Even at the time of Jesus' crucifixion, Peter still had doubts. He doubted himself, and he doubted God's grace that Jesus had told him about. But you see, they might not have understood all the implications of Peter's confession at this particular time, but they believed that Jesus, I believe all of them believed, that Jesus was the one who God had promised their nation to come and heal and save their land. Now, the people's misunderstanding might be traced back to the misunderstanding of the messianic role. You see, these folks, and you remember I taught a couple of weeks ago, did not really understand who the Messiah really would be and how he would come. They thought he would come as a mighty king dressed in these elaborate, expensive garbs and have servants and people around him. But you see, our king came as a servant. So they did not recognize his power or authority. You see, the first time he came, he came as a servant. When he returns, he will come as the almighty king. But the people at the time was expecting that part too at the very beginning. Jesus was not the kind of Messiah that they had been looking for or they had been studying in their religions. He had come to set the people free from sin, not a Roman dictatorship. His sole purpose was to save us. Before we can follow him as king, we had to be saved. Let's move on in the scripture, verses 21 through 22. But he strictly warned and instructed them to tell this to no one, saying, It is necessary that the Son of Man suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and scribes, be killed and be raised the third day. Wow. Do you realize... All you guys that played sports, you know, when you went over to the sideline, the coach gave you the game plan, and he says, this is how we're going to play the game, and this is how we're going to win the game. He just gave the disciples the game plan. They know now he told them exactly what's going to happen to him. They knew what to expect. Now, my question at this point, before we move on, did it really sink in at that time, what Jesus had said? Let's read on and find out. In verse 21, once Jesus established that his disciples knew who he was and what he had come to do, he quickly told them to keep these facts to himself. So he gave them the game plan, told them who he was, told them what was going to happen to him, but he said, don't tell anybody. This is just between us. Now, Luke said that he strictly warned and instructed them to avoid telling anyone about him being the Messiah. You see any reason why Jesus would do that? He wants us to accept him by knowing him personally by faith, right? He wants us to come to find out who he is. He does not need to come and give us a business card and say, this is who I am. We need to follow him and find out for ourselves who he is. He wasn't trying to hide his true identity. He also knew at this time there were many people who were simply not prepared to realize who he was. 
So things moved on. It's noticed that many Jews believed the Messiah was going to be a military leader. If those individuals had accepted Jesus with that expectation, that could have disrupted his true mission. Because, you see, he came to forgive sins and to heal people, not to create a military school with the Roman authorities. Now, as we move on through his ministry, we will find out that the Romans do take a part in this and are a part in his crucifixion. But this was not the time. You see, the Father's timing and his plan had to be fulfilled. And so that's what Jesus was doing at this time. So while Jesus understood that Peter's confession was correct, he also knew that it was incomplete. Because you see, in verse 22 here, Jesus again reminded his disciples that his true mission would involve glory only after suffering. Now, I want to bring something up here. Normally, I would not say very much, and I respect what David said as well. I don't try to talk about political or about other people's beliefs or views. That's their business. But i got to tell you, there are some preachers who are what I call feel-good preachers. And there are churches to where, you know, it's everything, is, it's motivational speaking. Let me tell you something. If you want proof of what Jesus said and the way life is going to be, I've had people tell, ask me many times, John, why is it good Christian people have to suffer like that? Why is it the king himself had to suffer like that? He said that's what's going to happen. So we were given no promises that if we accepted him, we can go through our life with mansions and gold brick faucets and live our whole life without pain, without diseases, without illnesses, or without slander. This comment right here is still as relevant today to us as his disciples as it was to this 12. He reminded them his true mission would involve glory only after suffering. If we suffer here on this earth, do we have glory too? Sure we do. Because we have the promise of everlasting life because of our faith and belief. If we endure these few short years on this earth, and believe me, the older we get, the shorter these years get. i got to tell you, time flies by from Christmas to Christmas. seems like just a month. But this time is nothing compared to eternity because you see it'll never end Ronnie we will be together like this we will be smiling we will be disease free we will be with every believer and we will be happy because we're with our Lord but it only comes after suffering Jesus said that so for the third time in chapter 9 at this point he predicts his crucifixion and resurrection Now, to emphasize that this was the Messiah's purpose in all of this, he used the term, and I'm speaking of Luke, son of man. Now, Luke often used that term when writing about Jesus' suffering and one that Jews closely associated with the anointed one. Because, you see, Jesus was fully man. He was 100% man, but he was also 100% God. Jesus said he would suffer many things and be rejected at the hands of the religious leaders. Now, would you have ever in a hundred years thought that the person who would kill the Messiah, that would actually crucify the living God, would be religious leaders? That's a, that's a freaky thought right there. And as Luke had noticed, they had already been scheming against Jesus. We taught this for the last several weeks. These authorities had been following Jesus, trying to catch him up. I taught a couple of weeks ago about the mere fact that every single thing Jesus said, they were trying to find that one thing that they could turn around on him to find a reason to persecute him. Now Jesus continued to emphasize that this suffering was necessary. And it was not an accident or a tragedy or something that kind of fell through the cracks, as we would say. It was destined by the Father in heaven to happen. It was the fulfillment of God's plan for salvation. Without this ever happening, none of us in this room could ever experience glory in heaven after we leave this earth. But he added that the cross would not be the final word because he would be raised the third day. Now how many times has he told this to the disciples? Now I know some of you out there are going, well I know you've told us about three or four times now John, so we got the point. Well he still felt like these disciples still did not quite hear what he's saying, so he told them again. Unfortunately, the disciples forgot his words until after the resurrection. Do you remember that scene after he was, uh, they hid and they thought my life is over, we're sunk, they're going to come for us next. 
He was a great man, but he's gone. See, they didn't remember these three or four times Jesus told them, but I'm coming back and I'll be resurrected on the third day. They forgot all about that. And here's your fun fact, Beth. You know, I have to give you one. It's been a while. Seems like it's been hours, right? But in fact, the religious leaders remembered Jesus' words at this time more so than his own disciples did. Because they, they thought, yeah, right, he says he's coming back. Let's just wait and see. Let's read our final verses this morning. Verses 23 through 27. Then he said to them all, If anyone wants to follow after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life because of me will save it. For what does it benefit someone if he gains the whole world and yet loses or forfeits himself? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him, and when he comes into his glory and that of the Father and the holy angels. Truly I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. Now, Beth wants to ask me a question, that is, how in the world could these people, he says some of the people in this room will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. Now you're going to say, just like her, how does that happen, John? Well, let me tell you something. I don't have the exact answer, but he pointed out here in verse 27 that some of those present would not taste death without seeing the kingdom of God. Obviously, some of these disciples suffered physical death. All of them did actually, and most of them suffered Uh, just a terrible death. In fact, some, if not many, had already died by the time Luke had written this gospel. So, what's the answer to that question? Well, I'm thinking to myself there could be a couple of things here. Number one, Jesus could be referring to the events on the Mount of Transfiguration. Because you remember they saw him on the Mount of of Transfiguration, which Luke described immediately after these verses we're looking at this morning. But then it's also possible that Jesus was emphasizing again that the kingdom was present wherever he was present. Because you see, he is the kingdom of God. Wherever he is will be the kingdom of God. So these are two reasons or explanations to that comment, I believe, that he made in verse 27. You know, it's an unspeakable comfort. I mean, I cannot even tell you what an awesome feeling it is to know that our Lord Jesus is God's anointed. He, is, he was chosen, he was anointed by God for this purpose. And that he was both appointed to be the Messiah, and not only appointed to be this person, but he is qualified to be this person. He never sinned, only man that will ever be sinless. And Jesus addresses his own sufferings and death. So he knew from the very beginning when he asked these guys, but who do the people say that I am? Who do they think I am? He knew. He knew what was going to happen to him. He knew that he would suffer a tremendous death, a painful death. He would be humiliated, but yet he knew he was coming back on the third day. He never doubted that. Now his disciples must be thinking at this particular point, how can we prevent his suffering? They loved this man. This was their leader. They followed him. So you know they're amongst themselves and having their little afternoon meetings. How can we keep this from happening? Well, see, they were missing the point. Because how many times did I say he told them he would suffer and die and be resurrected? Three or four times, yeah. But at this point, these guys, instead of worrying about trying to keep Jesus from living out what God's plan is, they should have been thinking about how they were going to deal with their own sufferings. Because Jesus had pointed that out to them as well. You too will suffer. You see, I think in our life we actually have crosses that are put in our way. And a lot of times we pick them up and we put them on our shoulders and we carry them instead of just laying them down at the feet of Jesus. We must carry them up. We must pick them up. But if we lay them down at the feet of Jesus, He will take care of that. That's the whole purpose of who He is and what He came to do. You know, I believe very wholeheartedly that the body cannot be happy if the soul is miserable. Think about that. The body cannot be happy if the soul is miserable. And that's in the other world. That's in this world. But if the soul is happy, though the body is afflicted and has pain and is sick, 
It will be oppressed in this world. But we know that if our soul is right while we live on this earth for these few brief years, even though we suffer physical or mental hardship, we know that in the next world, we will be totally and perfectly at tent. And we will be at peace with God. Jesus emphasized, again, I want to tell you as we conclude, suffering was necessary. So as you go through these valleys and you go through this suffering, the Bible says it's necessary. The key to these five verses is revealed in Jesus' question in verse 25. And that said, For what does it benefit someone if he gains the whole world and yet loses or forfeits himself? Now even if an individual gains the world, the victory would be temporary. There are many people that have lived their life to be the president of their company, to be a Pulitzer Prize winning individual. And that's all great. I salute that. I want to be the best I can be as well. But that's only temporary. The day you take your last breath, that will never mean a thing to you ever again. But one who pursues only what this world has to offer forfeits himself for eternity. And the Bible never says anywhere that you've got to give those things up to believe and follow Him. In many cases, by doing that, you are carrying out His ministry that He chose you for because you are being a Christian example in these places that you're working or these places, these things that you are pursuing. So I want to tell you this morning, and I hope, and I'm going to put it up here on the screen, I hope that you will verbally allowed, and I'm going to not be forceful with this, say this with me as we conclude this morning. I am not ashamed of Jesus. I am not ashamed of the gospel, and I'm not ashamed to live it. You see, Jesus went the final mile for me, so I would not be lost. The world offers you nothing that can compare to the grace of God. Amen. David, would you close us in prayer?